And welcome back, beloved. This is Keeping Passover and Unleavened Bread in 2022. This will be part two of a three-part discussion on Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, or Hag Hamatzah, which I've elected to entitle this particular discussion, the second part, Keeping Passover by Way of the Original Covenant. Now, as it relates to the honoring of the Passover of the original covenant, we must be on guard for those rabbinic traditions that tend to nullify and diminish Yah's Torah. We should first be aware that Passover or Pesach is a one-day festival that immediately precedes, is actually adjacent to the seven-day pilgrimage feast of unleavened bread, otherwise referred to in Hebrew as Hag Hamatzah. These two distinct festivals occur seamlessly synchronous. Passover occurs and then blends right into the start of Unleavened Bread, or ULB. And Pesach ends and ULB immediately begins. Because of this seamless synchronicity, most Torah-observant people view and treat Passover and Unleavened Bread as one eight-day feast. Mm. Now, in our last post, entitled Shabbat Haggadah, the path to redemption and atonement, we discussed the Hebrew concept of Zaman Kerutanu, Zaman Kiratanu, which essentially assigns Passover the central theme of it being a time to honor and reflect upon Yisrael's freedom from adject bondage and redemption from Egyptian slavery by the mighty hand and arm of Jehovah. Rav Shaul, also known as the Apostle Paul, wrote to the Messianic Assembly of Believers in Colossae, and Colossae, this is chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, and the English Standard Version reads, Therefore let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. Verse 17, these are shadows, these are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Messiah, to Christ, to Mashiach. The ancient English New Testament rendering of this passage is as follows. Let no pagan, therefore, judge you about food and drink, or about the distinctions of festivals and new moons and Shabbats, which were shadows of the things then future, but the body of Mashiach. Here is an, another example of Shaul having to put into proper perspective questions and issues related to his readers' respective walks in Messiah that one way or another made it to his attention. In this case, the Colossae assembly seemed to be undergoing some criticism from outsiders, outsiders of the assembly and the general body of Messiah, and their criticism regarded the keeping of the dietary laws and the various feasts and special days of Yah that are part and parcel of Yah's calendar year. Now, these criticisms, no doubt, were concerning to the assembly members, and it's conceivable that these criticisms may have even introduced some degree of confusion and uncertainty as it relates to the appropriateness of the members of the Colossian or the Colossian assembly keeping such mitzvot, such commandments, such traditions and observances. Paul, Shaul, attempts to refocus the Colossian Messianics' fears by counseling them to not pay those outside citizens or criticizers, if you will, any mind. Just ignore them, he's basically saying. In fact, the only individuals, according to Paul, who they should consult these Colossian Messianics, the, the, the assembly members of Colossae, the only individuals who they should consult in terms of these mitzvot, 
these traditions and observances, is the true body of Messiah, the true body of Mashiach. Not unconverted family members and so-called friends, not denominationalist teachers, preachers, and self-professing scholars, not bosses or co-workers, not only are these outsiders ignorant of the true importance of Yah's Torah to Yah's set-apart people, but their motives may be less than honorable and pure. These are journeying on a pathway that leads only towards darkness and ultimately destruction. Matthew chapter 7 verse 13 and Luke chapter 13 verse 24. Sadly, this Colossians passage has been hijacked by denominationalists who use it as one of their anti-Torah-proof passages. These insist that Shaul, Paul here, and in other similar passages, was effectively instituting a life of lawlessness for the New Testament people of God. Such thinking and twisting of Shaul's writings, as we've discussed numerous times on this platform, are just that. They're twisting of the apostle words, which effectively is a twisting of our master's teaching since we've shown also countless times that Shaul and Yehoshua, our master, were in lockstep as it related to their teaching and preaching of the gospel message. So then Shaul suggests that we consult only the true body of Mashiach as it relates to any questions or issues we may have regarding the keeping of feast, the keeping of Sabbath, the calendar, and the food laws. And today, since the true body of Messiah, the true body of Mashiach is so scattered, and I'm talking physically scattered as well as, well, I hate to say it, but doctrinally scattered in some sense, This is accomplished in whatever manner you are led. You are so led by Yah's Ruach, his spirit, however way you are led by Yah's spirit. For example, your local fellowship, the ministries based on the internet that you trust that are delivering the true gospel message and the Torah living. The written words of Yah's anointed teachers, preachers, and so forth. Those that we have trust in. And the trust we have is based upon their teachings coinciding and agreeing in lockstep with Yah's word. Clearly, the foundational element of Passover is Yisrael's exodus out of Egypt, or Mitzrayim. And many of us in this faith community place a great amount of emphasis on this reality. I've said this many times on this platform. We essentially remain at the base of Mount Sinai. Many of us do, I should say. Not all of us, but a great many of us. But if we can shift around our focus to that of the renewed covenant while appreciating that which we gain from the base of, or at the base of Mount Sinai, or the original covenant, using the Torah of the original covenant as our foundation and our guide, we will understand how to operate effectively in the renewed covenant. Some have likened our present situation in the body of Mashiach to that of our ancient Hebrew cousins, that we are effectively residing in the abject, bitter spiritual bondage of this world, and that it is scripture that tells us of a great exodus or a greater exodus to come, whereby those of us who will be chosen to be a part of that greater exodus will have to have an understanding of how to operate within the framework of that greater exodus. And the first exodus contains that knowledge, that information that will be needed to effectively navigate the greater exodus. We learn of this greater exodus this so-called greater exodus, 
as in Jeremiah or Yermiyahu chapter 23. I'll be looking at verses 3 through 8. And the Septuagint reads, verse 3, I will gather in the remnant of my people in every land whither I have driven them out and will set them in their pasture and they shall increase and be multiplied. Verse 5, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. Verse 7, Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when they shall no more say, The Lord lives, who brought up the house of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Verse 8, But the Lord lives, who has gathered the whole seed of Israel from the north land and from all the countries whither he had driven them out and has restored them into their own land. Isaiah also contributes to the discussion about the greater Exodus in chapters 14 and 43 of the Sefer that bears his name. And the Septuagint reads, Chapter 14, verse 1 of Isaiah. And the Lord will have mercy on Jacob and will yet choose Israel and they shall rest on their land and the strangers shall be added to them. Yea, shall be added to the house of Jacob. Chapter 14, verse 2. And the Gentiles shall take them and bring them into their place and they shall inherit them and they shall be multiplied upon the land for servants and handmaidens. And they that took them captive shall become captives to them. And they that had lordship over them shall be under their rule. Jumping to chapter 43, verse 5. Fear not, for I am with thee. I, am, I will bring thy seed from the east and will gather thee from the west. Chapter 43, verse 6. I will say to the north, bring, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from the land of far off, and my daughters from the ends of the earth, even all who are called by my name, for I have prepared him for my glory, and I have formed him and have made him. Ezekiel chapter 34, looking at verses 12 through 14. And the Septuagint reads, As the shepherd seeks his flock in the day when there is darkness and cloud, in the midst of the sheep that are separated, so will I seek out my sheep and will bring them back from every place where they are scattered in the day of cloud and darkness. And I will bring them out from the Gentiles and will gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land and will feed them upon the mountains of Israel and in the valleys and in the in every inhabited place of the land i will feed them in a good pasture on a high mountain of Israel and their folds shall be there and they shall lie down and they shall rest in perfect prosperity and they shall feed in a fat pasture on the mountains of Israel now, just in full disclosure, I know a lot of folks will read some of these uh, prophets, the Ezekiel, Isaiah, and Jeremiah prophets, prophecies that we just read as pertaining to the establishment of Israel, physical Israel, the modern nation of Israel over in the Middle East. And for the longest time, I used to believe that was the case when the nation was started up in 1948. Well, I'm having differences of opinion now as I look at these passages from more of a holistic standpoint. Because a lot of the things that are presented here do not extend or are not revealed in what we know of Israel today. We don't have these great things happening 
in the land of Israel today. And it hasn't been that way ever since they were established in 1948. So I don't necessarily think these passages pertain to the institution, to the establishment of the Jewish state over in Israel today. It's possible that there's some parallels here connected with that establishment, but I think these three passages are distinctly talking about the coming greater exodus, where Yah's set-apart people, if they happen to be blessed to be part of that, will be called out of all the nations of the world to participate in an exodus that will pale the original exodus of the book of Exodus, it will pale it. It will, it will pale that original Exodus in comparison. That's the way I see it. And you may have a difference of opinion, and that's fine. But this is something we need to start to think about, especially when we are looking at the original Exodus. Where is all of this heading in the end times? How do we make good use of the information we're receiving these days from the original covenant and the first exodus? How do we apply that information to the coming greater exodus? Just some thoughts and reflections there. But as arduous and tragic as our ancient Hebrew cousin's plight may have been during those many years of bitter bondage, that which Hasatan meant for evil, such that the utter and complete destruction of the Hebrew nation, Yah ultimately turned those lemons into lemonade. The squeezing of Yisrael during the time of their Egyptian enslavement served to keep the nation of Yisrael, the Hebrew nation, as one nation of people. For had there not been no bondage afflicted upon the people. If the people hadn't been enslaved, it is likely that the nation, assuming they would have still gone into Egypt to escape the famine, if there had been no bondage later on, the nation would have likely been absorbed into Egypt's melting pot of cultures and peoples. Yisrael could have just as easily been a brief note in the pages of human history. But Yah's plans for his bride Yisrael would not be deterred by the enemy's evil agenda, which in great part to destroy the people and lineage by which Messiah, Mashiach, would ultimately come. In the midst of Yisrael's bitter enslavement and bondage, Yehovah heard her cries, heard her pleas for freedom. And it was the cries of the people that prompted Yah to remember the covenant he'd made with Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Thus, Yah chose Moshe to lead his bride, Yisrael, out of bitter Egyptian bondage. Egypt's pharaoh would not, however, release Yisrael from their bondage without having to endure a series of Ten plagues that Yah declared would serve as judgment against the tribulators of his people and the gods of Egypt. Exodus, Shemot, chapter 12, verse 2. And I hearkened to the groaning of the children of Israel, and I remembered the covenant with you. And I will go throughout the land of Egypt in that night and will smite every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt will I execute vengeance. I am the Lord. Just prior to the final plague Yah would bring against the Egyptians and their gods, Yah's providence and foresight brought Yisrael to be favored by their Egyptian overlords. Those Egyptian overlords lavished their Israeli slaves with great material wealth. And this is supported by Exodus or Shemot chapter 11, 
verses 2, 3, 35, and 36. And so Yisrael did not leave Egypt as paupers, but as a wealthy nation. It was immediately after Yisrael plundered her overlords that Yah instituted the very first Pesach, or Passover ritual. And we find this in Exodus, or Shemot, chapter 12, verses 1 through 5. And the text reads, verse 1, And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, verse 2, This month shall be to you the beginning of months. It is the first to you among the months of the year. Verse 3, Speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, let them take each man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. Verse 4. And if they be few in a household, so that there are not enough for the lamb, he shall take with himself his neighbor that lives near to him. As to the number of souls, every one according to that which suffices him shall make a reckoning for the land. Verse 5. It shall be to you a lamb unblemished, a male of a year old. You shall take it of the lambs and the kids. Again, that was Exodus or Shemot chapter 12, verses 1 through 5. And if you've not already done so and are so led to do so, I would humbly invite you to read and or listen to our discussion entitled Shabbat Haggadol, The Pathway to Redemption and Atonement, where we discussed this very issue of uh, the beginning of the calendar year starting with the, this passage here, Exodus chapter 12, where Father establishes his reckoning of time in this passage. But continuing, this unblemished perfect lamb upon being selected by each household was to be kept by that household in their dwellings from the 10th to the 14th day of the month of the Aviv. And then sometime between noon and dusk on the 14th, they were, or the Hebrew, our ancient Hebrew cousins were instructed to slaughter the animal. Exodus chapter 12, verse 6. It's also referenced in Deuteronomy or Devarim chapter 16, verse 6. Two things were to happen to the carcass of the slaughtered lamb or kid. One, the ancient Hebrews or ancient Hebrew cousins were to collect the animal's blood and apply it to the doorpost and lintel of each home or dwelling, each Hebrew's home or dwelling. And two, they were to roast and eat the flesh of the animal along with unleavened bread and bitter herbs in haste. The Hebrew here being bekipazon, bekipazon, which means to go as in a hasty flight. And while fully dressed, that being our loins girded or belt on our waist, our sandals in or on our feet, and our staffs in our hands. Again, this is outlined in Exodus chapter 12, verses 7 through 11. Beloved, there is nothing likened unto the fancy schmancy elaborate satyrs that many Jews and Messianics have come to enjoy each Passover season. Maybe those modern satyrs have lost something in their translation or application of this solemn meal, and many of us have, as a consequence, become somewhat jaded by this event, this satyr event. And it's important to know the fullness of what happened back then, the first Exodus, the first Passover, and what y'all once us to get out of this set apart day. And certainly the forefathers, the forefathers did not have the luxury of such an elaborate occasion as many in our faith enjoy today in these very scripted and polished and 
well-adorned tables at these seders. Um, but that's just me. But the prophetic shadows of this ritual are easily recognized. Clearly, the unblemished lamb that would be selected on the 10th day, kept and tended by each family and then slaughtered four days later, is emblematic of our master, Yehoshua Messiah. Each of the elements of the meal, the Passover meal, carried with it a spiritual meaning. The bitter herbs representing the harshness and bitterness of our ancient Hebrews' captivity, ancient Hebrew cousins' captivity, the unleavened bread representing their move towards living a sinless life or our move towards living a sinless life, as well as it represented the haste by which we were to prepare and consume the meal. We were being readied for a hasty departure out of Egypt early in the morning finishing the entire meal that night without leaving any for the next day, burning whatever was left. The blood that was applied to the entrances of our homes was uh, indicative of our obedience to Yah's instructions, of Exodus chapter 12, verses 12 and 13. For the difference between life and death that night was the Hebrews' obedience. Those who obeyed Yah and applied the blood of the lamb or the kid to the doorpost and lentils of their homes, as instructed, would be spared grief and death and misery, while those who, for whatever reason, chose not to obey Yah suffered greatly. Those who obeyed got to leave Egypt and leave their life of bondage behind them. Conversely, those who, for whatever reason, chose not to obey Yah, no doubt stayed behind and had to endure whatever life awaited them in a land of many gods who would that night be judged by the one true and living Elohim, Yehovah. Death would bypass those marked homes that terrible night. And as a Shadow of that terrible night, we know that Yehoshua's blood, when applied to our lives, also spares us from eternal death and separation from Yah. Again, the prophetic shadows are too great to overlook or deny here. The Pesach, or Passover lamb, plays centrally in the tenth day of the month of the Aviv, as well as the Pesach sacrifice and how the sacrifice is to be treated. Yochanan, the immerser, that otherwise known as John the Baptist, declared of our master Yehoshua, look, God's lamb, the one who is taking away the sins of the world. John chapter 1, verse 29. That was the complete Jewish Bible rendering. Our Jewish cousins cannot appreciate Exodus or Shemot 12 as much as we can. For the first Passover or Pesach was not just the precipitating event that ushered in the Hebrew nation's exodus out of Egypt, their freedom, their redemption, and so forth, but it was also an emblematic rehearsal of the passion of our Master and Savior, Yehoshua Messiah. And as wondrous as the elements of the first Passover may appear to those of us in this faith community, we must keep it all. We must keep all those elements of that first Passover within their proper perspective. In other words, we must factor in the requirements of the renewed covenant that our master set forth for us while honoring and keeping Pesach or Passover in its proper spirit and truth paradigm. We'll talk more about that in a moment. We find then in verses 14 through 18 of the 12th chapter of Exodus or Shemot that Yah instructs us to keep the feast of Passover or Pesach, which includes both Passover night and the seven days of matzah or unleavened bread. Passover or Pesach is to be an everlasting ordinance, according to Yah, for his people. And during the seven days of matzah, 
ha matzah, unleavened bread, we are required to remove all leaven from our dwellings, not consume leavened foods and eat unleavened bread, perform no work and convene a sacred convocation on the first and seventh day of that seven day feast week. And this is all recorded in Exodus or Shemot chapter 12. You may hear from time to time, especially in Jewish and in some messianic circles, that the first and last day of Hamatzah or unleavened bread are high Sabbaths or high holy days. And these days are meant to focus our attention on Yah and the things he is doing for his people and not get caught up with the cares of this life. These are rest days. We are commanded to convocate or be a part of a sacred assembly or gather to worship Yah and learn of him and his ways. We are permitted to prepare meals on that day so as to enhance the celebratory nature of these set-apart days. There should be no other task, however, performed on those days. These are high holy days. These are pilgrimage feast days. Yah is emphatic that we have no leaven in our homes during these set-apart days, that we not consume any leaven during these set-apart days, and that we instead consume unleavened bread during these days, verses 19 and 20 of the 12th chapter of Exodus or Shemot. And this regulation still applies to us today. It is imperative that we go through our cupboards, our pantries, our refrigerators, our freezers, and rid them of any leavened or leaven-based products. Now, I will not take it upon myself to instruct you on precisely which items fall within this category of leavened products based upon the level of zeal we possess in serving and obeying Yah's instructions and in righteousness, will determine to what extent we rid our homes of any leaven or potential leaven products. And then after that, not consume. We're not to consume unleavened bread. And also, we are to consume matzah throughout the seven days of Hag HaMatzah, or unleavened bread. Hillary and I each year go out and purchase one of those big family-sized boxes of matzah, and we eat matzah with whatever main dishes we intend to eat each day throughout the seven-day feast period. And it essentially becomes a part of our lives for those seven days, and we look forward to it. We look forward to this each biblical calendar year. It's not a hassle for us. We've come to look forward to and enjoy this thing. I mean, it's not like matzah is a wonderful tasting food, but eventually, if your heart is in it, you, you actually learn to like it and enjoy it. And that's what, at least for me, that's what it's become. And so the first Passover, Pasach, Pesach or Passover was inaugurated in the land of Egypt. And the firstborn of those dwellings that did not have the blood of the Pesach applied to it, as well as the firstborn of the cattle, all died that night, including Thutmose the fourth's firstborn son. The firstborn of the homes, primarily those of the Hebrews that had the Pesach's blood applied to them, well, Yah spared as the destroyer went throughout the land of Egypt. Exodus chapter 12, verses 23 and 29. And there's a lot to be said about the issue of the firstborn being the target of Yah's judgment. Recall back in chapter 2 of Exodus, or Shemot, that an unidentified Pharaoh commanded the Hebrew midwives to kill the boys of those born to Hebrew mothers at their birth, while sparing the girls, verse 15 and 16. And this is, again, in the second chapter of Exodus. And when that didn't quite pan out because of Yah's mercy and grace, Pharaoh commanded the citizens of Egypt to cast every boy born to a Hebrew family into the Nile River, 
while sparing the Hebrew girls, verses 17 through 22, of, again, of the second chapter of Exodus. This obviously upset Yah immensely. We know that Yah has always had a special place in his heart for firstborn children, especially those firstborn of his covenant people. And when Pharaoh launched a war against the male offspring of his covenant people, well, he crossed a line with Jehovah that could not be reversed. Yah viewed his covenant people as his firstborn. The shadows of this cannot be overstated. Of this issue related to the firstborn, Yah stated to Moshe, Exodus chapter 4, looking at verses 22 and 23, Exodus 4, verse 22 reads, And you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus said the Lord, My son, my firstborn, is Israel, verse 23. And I said to you, Send off my son that he may worship me. And you refuse to send him off. And look, I am about to kill your son, your firstborn. Now, back to the unleavened bread that the Hebrew had with their Pesach and bitter herbs during that night to be most remembered. There are tremendous spiritual and prophetic shadows associated with it, which we've touched ever so lightly in our discussion here, and we'll certainly look at it a little later on. But there are also practical aspects of the unleavened bread, as well as it related to the Exodus. For we find in verse 39 of the 12th chapter that practically speaking, the Hebrews' departure was of such a hasty manner that they had not, they had not, no time, I should say. They didn't have time to prepare meals for their journey. Therefore, they baked unleavened cakes for their journey. Unleavened cakes can be made very, very, very quickly. Hillary makes unleavened cakes uh, and has made unleavened cakes on many occasions just for something quick to snack on. And it's, um, it's, pretty, it's pretty cool. It literally takes her no time. Because this was done because there was no time to allow for the dough to rise. We had the, the, the Hebrews, our ancient cousins, had to leave the land now. The next several verses of the 12th chapter impress the, uh, or I should say emphasizes the swiftness of events that occurred, that Pesach, that Passover, that night to be most remembered, all leading to the people's immediate departure from Goshen in Egypt the very next morning. The text states, verse 51 of the 12th chapter, and it happened. On that very day that the Lord brought the Israelites out of the land of Egypt in their battalions. And that was the Robert Alter translation. And so by this point, we have the nuts and bolts of Pesach laid out before us here in the 12th chapter of Exodus or Shemot. However, we find in Numbers, the Midbar, chapter 9, record of the Hebrews' second Passover observance, a second Passover observance in the wilderness, where Yah added to the Exodus 12 ordinance the element and requirement of ritual purity for any who would keep Pesach. And again, this is Numbers chapter 9, and we're talking specifically about verses 1 through 3. So any who, during the appointed time of Pesach in the month of Aviv, any who, during the appointed or original time of Pesach in the month of Aviv, any who were found to be in a state of ritual impurity would be expected to keep Passover or Pesach on the 14th day of month two of the biblical calendar year at dusk. This Passover, this Pesach is called Pesach Shini. Pesach Shini. Pesach is to be honored and kept by every Hebrew, and thus Yah made provision for those who might find themselves in a position not to keep it. He is a merciful and loving Elohim. 
But it should be understood that we have no record in Torah of the Hebrews keeping Pesach beyond the second one as reckoned or recorded in Numbers or Bamidbar 9. Not until the conquest of the land of promise that we have mention of another or a third or succeeding Passovers that were kept by our ancient Hebrew cousins. Joshua chapter 5, verses 9 through 12. And the Septuagint reads, And the Lord said to Joshua the son of Nun, On this day have I removed the reproach of Egypt from you. And he called the name of that place Gilgal. Verse 10. And the children of Israel kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at evening to the westward of Jericho on the opposite side of the Jordan and the plain. Verse 11. And they ate of the grain of the earth unleavened and new corn. See, they not only kept Passover, but they also conducted Yom Hanafat HaOmer, or the wave sheaf offering at that time, which is a requirement in order for us to consume any new grain from the harvest of the land that would be forthcoming. Continuing, verse 12, in this day, the manna failed, the manna failed. After they had eaten of the corn of the land, and the children of Israel had not any more manna, but they did eat of the product of the land of Canaan during that year. And again, that was Joshua chapter 5, verses 9 through 12. Thus, we have the template before us for keeping Pesach in the original covenant, or under the auspices of the original covenant. There should be no excuses for keeping it by any of Yah's covenant people. But is this the whole of the story that we should follow or that our ancient Hebrew cousins followed after they inherited the land of promise? And the answer is no. Yah actually made alterations to Pesach that all but eliminated the application of the Pesach's blood to the doorposts and lintels of our homes as well as the keeping of Pesach shifted from that of a family, a home-centered observance, to that of a national observance at one central location, the place where Yah, our father, chose or chooses to place his name. Because we would be spread out across the land of Canaan, Yah instructed that Passover, Pesach, Unleavened bread be a required annual pilgrimage feast. We talked about this earlier. Every household would be required to journey to the place where Yah chose to establish his name for purposes of observing Passover or Pesach. The Pesach would now be sacrificed at the central location, that is, at the place where the tabernacle or the temple stood. Keeping Pesach, Passover, unleavened bread is a requirement for every chosen child of the Most High. However, because Yah altered the parameters and elements of this ordinance, and we no longer have a true functioning Levitical priesthood, nor a functioning standing temple or tabernacle for that matter, we cannot keep Pesach as Yah conveyed to us in Torah. However, under the auspices of the renewed covenant, we are compelled to keep the elements of the ordinance of Passover or Pesach that remain viable to us today, all in the spirit and all in truth, all in spirit and in truth. One of the things we as renewed covenant saints in training is that we follow the example of our master in terms of our keeping the ordinances of Passover. And we'll discuss this in our next installment. Now, a handy, or I should say a handful, of key concepts must be factored into our understanding and even keeping of Pesach as outlined in the original covenant. One, the Pesach of the original covenant 
that is, the covenant passed down to us through Moshe, or Moshe, was part and parcel of our leaving Egypt and going to a destination that Yah had chosen for us. And from a historic standpoint, it was Yah remembering the covenant he made with Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, redeeming them and leading them out of Egyptian bondage, both the physical and spiritual bondage, and to the land that he swore to give to Abraham as an inheritance. And so from a spiritual standpoint, it symbolized this Passover, symbolized Yah's plan of salvation, redemption, and restoration, whereby Yah calls for, uh, uh, Yah makes provision, I should say, for his chosen ones who enter covenant with him to leave Egypt. This leaving of Egypt factors in prominently to our understanding of Passover, Pesach, under the paradigm or auspices of the original covenant. This departing Egypt to rid themselves of anything having to do with Egypt. And so Egypt and Babylon are symbolic of the world. Yah calls his own to leave the world and go to the place, go to the life that he has established for them. Yochanan, also known as John the Revelator, records the words of a voice out of heaven that declared, Come out of her, that is, come out of spiritual Babylon, come out of spiritual Egypt, come out of the world, my people that you may not participate in her sins and may not partake of her plagues. For her sins have reached up to heaven and Elohim has remembered her iniquities. And that was Revelation chapter 18, verses 4 and 5, the Aramaic English New Testament rendering. Yah, through the prophet Jeremiah, admonishes Yisrael to Flee from the midst of Babylon. This is Jeremiah chapter 51, verses 6 and 45. Flee from the midst of Babylon. Let everyone save his life. Be not cut off in her punishment, for this is the time of Yah's vengeance, the repayment he is rendering her. Go out of the midst of her, my people. Let everyone save his life from the fierce anger of Yah. Likewise, the prophet Isaiah, in a prophetic sense, admonishes Yisrael, pointing to the coming greater exodus of Yah's elect. And this is found in, again, uh, here we're at Isaiah chapter 48, verses 20 and 21. This is the Septuagint. Go forth of Babylon, thou that fleest from the Chaldeans, Utter aloud a voice of joy, and let this be made known. Proclaim it to the end of the earth. Say ye, the Lord hath delivered his servant Jacob. And if they shall thirst, he shall lead them through the desert. He shall bring forth water to them out of the rock. The rock shall be cloven, and the water shall flow forth and my people shall drink. Rav Shaul, also known as the Apostle Paul, declares this same call of Yah's people coming out of the world in his second letter to the Messianic Assemblies in Corinth. And this is in chapter 6, verses 15 through 18. And the, prof, the Apostle wrote, of, or what agreement... Or what agreement has the, mess of the, has the Messiah, has the Mashiach, with the accuser? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? Verse 16. Or what agreement has the temple of Elohim with that of demons? For you are the temple of the living Elohim. As it is said, I will dwell among them and walk among them and will be their Elohim and they will be my people. Verse 17, wherefore you come out from among them and be separate from them, says Master Jehovah, and don't come near the unclean thing. 
here talking about Yah's insistence that his chosen ones remain in a state of spiritual and ritual purity at all times. Continuing, and I will receive you, verse 18, and will be to you a father, and you will be sons and daughters to me, says Master Yehovah, the Almighty. Thus, Passover, Pesach, serves as a rehearsal as a foreshadowing of our departure from the world via what has been dubbed as a greater exodus and our settling into a restored land of Israel. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 5 and Hebrews chapter 10 verse 1. From a historic perspective, Yah required any who would partake of the Pesach, the Passover, to be circumcised. Exodus, Shemot, chapter 12, verses 48 and 49. And should a sojourner sojourn with you and make the Passover offering to the Lord, he must circumcise every male of his. Then may he draw near to do it, and he shall be like a native of the land. But no circumcised, or I should say, no uncircumcised man shall eat of it. One law shall there be for the native and for the sojourner who sojourns in your midst. So Yah put forth the requirement of circumcision for any who would partake of the Pesach or Passover. And I've come across Messianic ministries that teach any male who would partake of the Passover or Pesach Seder today, they must be circumcised. I've expressed my personal views on the application of the mitzvah of physical circumcision for modern day Messianics in the post entitled Paul on Physical Circumcision for God's People, a question of one's Jewishness, part three. And if you've not had the opportunity to listen to or read that post again, as I stated before, and you're so led, I would humbly encourage you to do so. But I would go so far as to submit this to you, that under the auspices of the renewed covenant, we are all required to be circumcised, but circumcised first and foremost of the heart, as taught by Rav Shaul in Romans chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. For he is not a Jew who is so in what is external, nor is that circumcision, or is that only physical circumcision, which is visible in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is so in what is hidden, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from Elohim. And Shaul kind of repeats himself about this whole issue of true circumcision, that true circumcision being of the heart um, in um, over in second Corinthians, second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 18 and Colossians chapter two, verse 11 and Philippians chapter three, verse three. We also find in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 16 and Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse six, as well as Jeremiah chapter four, verse four, where Father calls for a circumcision of the heart first and foremost. Physical circumcision for male believers aside, I believe covenant believers who uh, are circumcised of heart are eligible to partake in the Passover or Pesach. Again, I, we can't keep Passover as conveyed to us by Yah for the previously stated reasons. Therefore, we keep Passover in spirit and in truth with a circumcised heart. And we do so with purity of heart, purity of body, purity of soul. Shaul admonished the Messianic assembly in Corinth over in his first letter to the Corinthians chapter five, looking at verses seven and eight, he wrote, purge out from you the old leaven, that you may be a new mass, as you are unleavened. 
For our Passover is the Messiah, the Mashiach, who was slain for us. Verse 8. Therefore, let us celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven. In other words, let us celebrate Passover or unleavened bread, but not with the leaven, the old leaven, nor with the leaven of wickedness and bitterness, but with the leaven or the unleavened bread of purity and sanctity. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. Well, uh, that's going to wrap it up for this one. Um, and I pray that you got something out of this discussion on keeping Passover and unleavened bread by way of the original covenant. For we can't fully appreciate and understand keeping these set apart days unless we have a full grasp of what the original covenant had to say about them. Now, in the third and final installment of this series, we'll discuss keeping Passover by way of the renewed covenant. And I'll see you on the other side.